Namaste. So I'm speaking now with my own opinions, with my own views, which actually are not my own, <laughs> but that I have encountered in different places and times about the state of the world. I'm interrupting for the time being the Drig Drishya Viveka series because I've gotten several urgent requests to speak to this question, which is what the heck is going on? The temple bells are here to remind us that what we see in the world is simply the play of Shakti. Huh? The pastimes, the sport of the mother in creating the world. And she makes this world imperfect on purpose. So that we are reminded that this is not really our home. This is not really who we are. This is not really the reality. This is only an appearance. And what it is, is a stage. And a stage is a place for a drama. And the drama here is the play of fall and redemption. Yin and yang. Darkness and light. So everything we see here is simply a shadow of the actual reality. And of course, we've been doing our best, our imperfect uh, efforts, or still our best attempt to awaken people to the actual reality. So what is going on in the world today is that we're seeing the fall of an empire. The empire is the United States of America and its global domination over the last two centuries or so. And it's not over yet. It's not the end of that particular cycle, but we're fast approaching it. The US dollar is now the reserve currency of the entire world, except for a, a few groups of countries who are in rebellion against it. But it is the uh, greatest symbol of American domination of the world scene, which has been pretty much a de facto standard globally, especially since the end of the Second World War and the Bretton Woods Agreement. So now Bretton Woods is unraveling. The dollar is off the gold standard, which means it's being hyperinflated. The government is printing money like it's going out of style, which it is. <laughs> the dollar is soon going to uh, lose its status as the world reserve currency. And these changes are inevitable. But in the case of the US, they're very necessary because the US was founded on the terrible genocide of the North American native peoples. Now, you might ask, well, how do you know this? How do you know what, what you're saying is true? And I can point to several commentators and analysts, especially Ray Dalio and the British historian Grubb, who both wrote about the cycle of empire. And of course, going back to the uh, Gibbons decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which should be required reading for everybody who thinks they're an American right now. But for me personally, it goes back to 1968. In 1968, I married a woman who was half Native American, half Navajo. Her uh, mother was Navajo and her father was Irish, I believe. A bad combination. <laughs> because of the Irish propensity for drink and the 
limited tolerance of the Native Americans uh, to alcohol. So anyway, when we got married in California, she said, I want to show you my country. I, I met you in your country, in your culture, uh, which was late 60s hippie culture. <laughs> I was a musician. And she said, I want you to come to my country. Let's go to New Mexico and the Navajo Reservation. So we piled our meager possessions in my van and off we went. And of course, I was blown away. What a beautiful and stark and powerful country. And the people were also amazing and strong and wild. And I was in a position to learn the ancient ways of the Native Americans, which I did. And I hung out a lot with the Native American uh, elders and wise men. And I did a lot of ceremony with them. And a, a lot of sweats, a lot of peyote rituals, a lot of, uh, even I did the sun dance. Still got the scars. <laughs> So what did I learn from them? They told me that the United States of America is cursed. It's cursed because they built their biggest cities over literally over the blood and bones of the Native Americans without any respect for their culture. Huh? The, the Native Americans welcomed the Europeans at first but when it soon became apparent that their character, their nature, and their actual objectives, the Native Americans withdrew, and then they started to resist. So, of course, this is a long, sad tale, and everybody knows the ending. Today, the Native Americans are pretty much prisoners uh, in their own land. A great, great tragedy. And then let's not forget the millions of African slaves who worked and slaved and died to build America. And this racial disparity is written right into the Declaration of Independence of the American States. That anybody who's not a white Christian is less than a full human being. And it's right there in black and white. So because of this fundamentally racist attitude, so many terrible things have been done in the name of fanatical Christianity. And Christianity is a very deficient religion, a very, a very uh, stupid worldview. Why? Well, in the beginning, it might have had some potency. But around the 10th century, the uh, Catholic missionaries started debating the Greeks. Now, it's actually earlier than that, 7th or 8th century. And the Greeks would sit down for debate and they'd say, okay, well, first of all, what is your theory of knowledge? What is your epistemology? What is your ontology? What is your system of logic? And the Catholics are going, uh, well, uh, Jesus died for your sins. <laughs> The Greeks are saying, get out of here. They laughed them out of the debates. So Catholics went home, licking their wounds, and they spent almost two centuries in debate about what they should do about this, because they were getting their asses kicked. So after two centuries of <laughs> debate, they decided on a philosophy and a system of knowledge. And unfortunately for everybody in the world, they chose Aristotle. Aristotelian logic is too valued. Yes or no, right or wrong, good or bad, saved or sinner. And this flawed, actually infantile system of logic has been the basis of Western philosophy ever since. Oh, they still couldn't win any debates with the Greeks, so they simply slaughtered them. <laughs> That's Christianity. 
So now we are at the tail end of the Christian era. Because of all of its terrible crimes, uh, which are being uh, exposed more and more every day, the uh, chauvinism and the racism and the sexism, the child molestations and so on, then the whole thing is in a state of collapse. As I said, you can read any of the really good analysts on the cycles of history and you'll see this is their verdict. Now, these are the people who are unbiased and who are looking for the indicators of the state of empire and civilization. So the same things that we see, for example, the unbasing of the currency from anything of real value, financialization of the currency into an instrument of debt, uh, which means, for, first of all, the US dollar was a silver certificate that you could actually redeem a US dollar for some silver coins. And then the US dollar was pegged, uh, it became a, a floating currency that was pegged to a specific value of an ounce of gold. And then that value kept getting lower and lower and lower. <laughs> and finally, Nixon in 1972 said, ah, forget it, let's simply make it float. Fiat currency, its value is what we say it is. So that took the US off the gold standard. And that is historically one of the symptoms of a failing empire. They take their currency off the gold standard or off any standard of value, and it simply becomes fiat money. So, I mean, you might say, well, now the dollar is determined in, a, in a, the value of oil. But obviously, that's not a very stable thing. Pretty, pretty uh, short time ago, oil was actually valued in the negative. <laughs> There was so much that people were willing to pay you to store it. So anyway, the U.S. is in that situation. And China will also very shortly be in a similar situation due to its demographic problems, due to its, uh, the nature of its state is oppression at the, uh, at the end of a gun. Huh? Force is the only thing that keeps the Chinese empire together. So shortly after the U.S. empire begins to unravel, which it already has, we'll see the Chinese empire going through similar change. I was just listening to an Indian news analyst. By the way, the news here in India is much less biased than it is in the West. You would never hear this news in the West. He was saying that the, out of the, all of the Chinese territory now claimed as China, huh, the actual core is the coastal elite, the 18 provinces along the, the coast of China that are historically the home of the Han race, and that these have oppressed all the other areas that are currently known as China. And as soon as they're unable to keep the economy going, uh, there's going to be a big revolt and you're going to see China break up. And this isn't going to happen overnight, just like the fall of America isn't going to happen overnight. It might take 50 or 100 years, but it's in the unstoppable beginning stages of dissolution of empire. And we've done a couple of videos uh, earlier on this topic. So then what's going to happen? Well, I see the rise of India, or more properly, Bharata. Now, if you look on the money, the Indian rupee, the name of the country is Bharata. Thank you very much. The name India is a foreign name, comes from the British, just like the name Hindu is a foreign name that comes from the Muslim invaders. 
But you see, the nature of the people of India is to adapt. They adapt very well to the circumstances. So if they couldn't prevail by force, then they submitted and adapted, but they still keep the core of their culture, which is, of course, the Vedas. And the Vedas say that Brahman is the source of everything. So we have been discussing over the last couple of years on this channel, this view that Brahman is the source of everything. Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. So everything that we see in the world, the Jagat, uh, the multiplicity of the world, is basically an illusion. And it's temporary. So even the greatest empire, even the richest capitals, even the most successful oppressors and repressors and depressors in the world cannot last forever. They come into being at a certain time, they remain for a while, they reach their peak and then they decline and pretty soon they're finished. So what we're saying is our bet is on India, our bet is on Bharata that demographically, economically, and most important, culturally speaking, Bharata has the makings of the next great world power. And I know most of you have already tuned out. Only the hardy few viewers remain to hear this. But if you are intelligent enough to read the writing on the wall, uh, to see what's coming. Uh, get out of the stock market, get out of the dollar or the yuan, and invest in Bharata, because Bharata is going to be the final winner, the last one left standing at the end of all this. And it's not going to be a, a smooth process. It's going to be a very bumpy ride, going to be lots of ups and downs, but still, the end is in sight now. Within the next 50 to 100 years, we'll see Bharata emerge as the world leader. So this is my opinion, and it has been my opinion since like 1968. <laughs> and it's very nice that the recent research is uh, supporting and substantiating this opinion. Because in, in my view, it always has been that Indian culture, Indian philosophy, Indian religion is the best in the world. The Vedas are the preeminent scriptures of the whole world. And the Vedic culture, which is based on inclusive, inclusiveness, uh, rather than domination of one race or one color or one creed over another, is the most robust, anti-fragile, and ultimately most successful and longest lasting culture in the world. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.